the picture. Certainly, all of you were not even conceived when that picture was taken. But I certainly was uh, a young boy, younger than you are now, when that picture was taken. And it's certainly one of the most widely publicized pictures. But to me, it actually brings up a perspective that, frankly, we never had before. And I really think the modern sustainability movement was accelerated with that simple picture. It also allows me to say a lot without having to say a lot. It sort of puts it all in perspective. So indeed, I'm going to touch on some global warming issues that, uh, frankly, I was doing geothermal long before I heard about global warming. But back in about uh, the year 2000, 2001, we had actually installed a geothermal system at Lemoyne College. We got front page of the Syracuse Post above the fold. We got live TV remote broadcast from the job site. So it was pretty cool. They were interviewing the dean or the, the I, forget, I don't think he's called the dean, but the head of Lemoyne College. And he's a priest, Jesuit priest. He's out there with his white collar on, and they're interviewing him live on TV5 News. But the engineer somewhere screwed up. Down at the bottom, they put live from Lemoyne College, John Manning. Me. So it wasn't me, but it did make my mother awful proud for a moment. So, but we got a lot of recognition, and I had somebody call me up and ask uh, if I could uh, join them at a meeting they were having right here at ESF campus. And I don't know if Rick Smarden is still teaching here. Do you guys know Rick? He, I think he just retired. Just retired. Charlie Hall. And, oh my gosh, all these people are getting old. But I got involved with that organization. It was the, oh, what the heck was it called? Central New York Global Warming Network, um, or, or Global, Nor Global Warming Network of Central New York. And I went to talk about geothermal, and then I stuck around and listened to what they were talking about, what they were planning on doing. And just like geothermal, I became hooked on this issue, that I truly believe it is the most important issue that our species is going to face in the coming decades. And we should have faced it 30 years ago. We're still not facing it. So good luck in your endeavors and make a difference. So global warming, fact or fiction? Well, the debate is over. Anybody who is touting the fact that, oh, it's not man-made or any of that naysayer delusional denial, uh, frankly, I don't give them any attention. They don't know what they're talking about. The time is now for us to lead, and you are going to be in a position where you will need to lead the discussion in each of your jobs. Um, do not take no for an answer. Understand the issues and make it happen. Um, and if we got time at the end, I'll tell you the one word story. How do we know this? Through a technique uh, of sampling ice cores and current data, we're looking back over a million years in embedded micro bubbles in ice core samples. There's some of the work that was done by Lonnie Thompson. And through CO2 levels that are truly entrained within the micro bubbles in the ice, they can truly look back in time and determine what the CO2 levels were eons ago. And also through the ratio of oxygen isotopes, they can deduce what the average temperature was. And if we look back over the last 650,000 years, indeed, carbon dioxide levels have fluctuated. And when people say, well, it's the natural rhythm of the planet, indeed, there's some truth to that. 
what they call the Milankovitch cycles of the wobble of the Earth's axis, the rotation of the major e, uh, axis of the ellipse of our orbit, uh, solar conditions, a whole bunch of factors go into creating a natural cycle. And lo and behold, temperatures correlate to that. There's no doubt, this is real science, collaborated with at least 2,500 scientists all over the world, part of the UN um, activities. But since we've started burning hydrocarbons, there's been a sudden increase in CO2 levels. Recently, we reached 400 parts per million. So you cannot say this is a natural artifact of anything other than some species on this planet who is uh, converting carbon into carbon dioxide. And indeed, if we remain on this trajectory, we're headed for uncharted territories. And frankly, I think the best of scientists can't really predict what's going to happen. We're entering an age of discovery. And yes, we will discover some 5,000-year-old bodies that are appearing as glaciers are receding. But more importantly, we're going to discover who we are as a species. Are we capable of organizing and changing our behavioral patterns in everything we do? That's the discovery yet to be uh, realized. We need bold action. And this is a clip from a uh, preface to an energy policy in Denmark where they indeed have banned the use of fossil fuels for space heating. Interesting bold, uh, reflects a real understanding of the challenge that we face. And the question you want to ask yourself, can it happen here? A lot of forces will prevent any such bold move. Maybe it should. If we're going to get off the fossil fuel habit, we're going to have to have definitive and bold decisions being made at a level that are immune to lobbyists and special forces. Even today, a court of, uh, the appellate court was listening to two coal companies trying to dismantle the recent EPA rulings about climate change related emissions. So these are the forces that are going to prevent us from making change. Maybe it needs to. I'm not one to advocate government mandating anything. I really think our current government situation is all too powerful and in our face every day on one thing or another. But in issues like this, this is where they can really prove their worth and demand the right action. Imagine 25 barrels of oil. You know, it's five by five, it would fill a good chunk of this room right here. But let's scale that up to a thousand barrels of oil. That's a lot of oil. And every second, that many barrels of oil are being transformed from a carbon, a hydrocarbon, into carbon dioxide and a whole bunch of other chemicals, unburned hydrocarbons, you name it, what comes out of burning fossil fuels is not just carbon dioxide. And in our brief hour and a half together tonight, 5.4 million barrels of oil will be transformed, producing nearly 16 billion pounds of carbon dioxide. And that goes on hour by hour, day after day, and uh, it's going to be hard to stop that freight train. 
Moving beyond opinions, we seem to get the airways filled with various opinions. How do we move beyond them? And I'm going to suggest that we move through the steps of opinions. One, there's the delusion. Maybe not a whole lot we can do about that, but there's a lot of people that are just fundamentally in denial and deluding themselves that climate change is not a reality. Then we have the biased, the special interest groups those in a position of power, and they want to maintain that power. And lastly, what I encourage you to do is become informed and make your own decisions. Because there's plenty of examples in the past where certain opinions were widely held. And only through scientific exploration, in fact, that indeed it was proven without a doubt that this is delusional. How about the one where the earth is at the center and the sun revolves around the earth and the entire universe revolves around the earth? Widely held opinion. You were at risk of being uh, put to death or at least under house arrest for advocating any other opinion. And indeed, it was delusional. How about the fact that continents are fixed? They don't move, which was a widely held opinion until the, about the 1960s when uh, tectonic plate theory really became accepted and subsequently proven that the continents indeed are in constant motion. So again, an opinion that turned out to be delusional. What about this? Climate change is not man-made. It is the natural rhythms of the planet, and besides, there is nothing we can do about it. Hopefully, soon, we will all look back and say that, too, was delusional. The common thread of all these beliefs. When prevailing popular opinion is challenged by scientific observation, it threatens the status quo. And the existing power structure exercises their authority or wealth to attack these threats. And that's what we're witnessing today. The challenge of stabilizing atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide. If governments decide to stabilize, well, I took this quote and simply said, the government works for us. So if we decide, each and every one of us embraces the challenge, then we might stand a chance to level it off. Bill McKibben is promoting 350 as the target parts per million goal. Well, we're already 50 parts above that. Uh, to reverse carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is an enormous undertaking through a process of carbon sequestration, which on a large scale has not been demonstrated at all. So indeed, maybe 550. 650. Wherever we can stop it, we need to. But we're going to have to stop. It's going to have to peak within 10 years and be at back down to current day levels by 2040 to 2070. Certainly well within your professional career window. This would mean that all regions, all sectors, everything we do lights, air conditioning, cars, you name it. Every aspect of our life has to change. It's a daunting challenge. CO2 emissions, pounds per year, let me put it in perspective for you. If we left a 100-watt light bulb, which uh, we can't really buy anymore, 
I don't know if it's in effect yet or not, but the incandescent bulb was typically 100 watts. If we only operated it two hours a day, back at the power plant that's producing that electricity, that would account for 77 pounds of carbon dioxide in one year. Let's kick it up. An SUV. Man, they are one of the favorite targets of environmentalists. I happen to like SUVs, so I'm in conflict with the, uh, the right choices. Fortunately, there's a lot of good work being done in the automotive industry as we speak. A friend of mine bought a Tesla. He loves it. This guy's from Germany. He was a diehard Mercedes fan, and he's a motorhead. He knows his cars. He took a test drive in a Tesla. He said, John, when I got out of that car, you couldn't wipe the smile off my face. So it was remarkable technology being incorporated in some uh, pretty slick uh, hardware. But moving on up, somebody we don't attack very often is Grandma. Grandma lives in a little 1,500 square foot house. She burns oil to stay warm, and she does cook some cookies once in a while. But Grandma's going to produce 24,000 pounds of carbon dioxide just to maintain her meager lifestyle. Let's talk about something you might relate to. A 30,000 square foot office building, a modest office building, to heat and cool that building, to heat it with what we're trying to be induced into believing by natural gas, was, which is such an environmentally wonderful thing, if you believe the commercials. And air conditioned with the New York State minimum air conditioning technology. So it's just breaking the law, or just above breaking the law. That building will produce 341,000 pounds of CO2 the first year. And if you've ever worked around combustion products, five years from now, ten years from now, you know that it's not going to be operating as efficiently as it is today. So ten years from now, this building could easily be at 400,000 pounds of CO2 because of the decision that was made when the building was designed and the mechanical systems were specified. We are, we are casting a fate when we make those decisions. That is pretty hard to undo. So what is geothermal? And of course, as soon as that word hits your gray matter, it often conjures up old faithful. Not. Old Faithful represents what we call the hot rocks, or capital G geothermal. Indeed, it's a wonderful resource to tap into, but it's rare when you really find the opportunity to do it. The Blue Lagoon in Iceland is probably the best known example. We have capital G geothermal power plants out west. New Zealand has them. It's a great technology but it's never going to really move the needle the way we need it moved. So the geothermal that I've become familiar with is nothing more than building a heat exchanger in the earth. And we circulate a fluid through that piping system and we extract heat from the ground. And in the summertime, it's very efficient to put that air conditioning heat into the ground. It works both ways. There's a lot of names that have been around for 30 or 40 years, and that adds to the confusion of why geothermal has not become more widely understood or accepted. I like the words geothermal heat pumps. There's only two problems. One is the word geothermal, and the other is the words heat pumps. Other than that, it's a great name. They both conjure up misconceptions. Geothermal, the Blue Lagoon. Heat pumps, if you've ever lived with an air source heat pump, 
you quickly decide that you don't really want that as your heating system. Little things like defrost cycles. When I stood in the bathroom to shave and my air source heat pump went into defrost, which means it goes into the air conditioning mode, that wakes you up pretty fast in the morning. A little cold air blowing up your uh, uh, half-naked body. So what is the definition of geothermal? Technically, it is a water source heat pump system that uses the renewable energy stored in the earth as a heat source as well as a heat sink. A little technical. Uh, may not be appreciated by everybody. I prefer this definition. Geothermal is the most energy efficient, environmentally clean, and cost effective space conditioning system available and readily deployable today. 100,000 units plus every year are being installed. The market has been growing, not as fast as we'd like it to, but it's a proven technology that's been around in practice for 40 years, in theory, for about 150 years. So, it's not rocket science. And when I say cost effective, everybody's eyebrows go a little funny. Oh, I heard it always costs more. It does. But if you're going to invest money into infrastructure, what is better than buried pipe in the ground that is going to last 100 years without maintenance? How many infrastructure projects do you think can compete with that? Not many. Bridges certainly don't last that long and they certainly require a lot of maintenance. But our heating system, you could install it connected to a building and chances are very good that that heat exchanger will outlast the building. Back in 1993, Michael LeCure, who worked for the EPA, wrote a pretty profound document titled Space Conditioning, the Next Frontier. He looked at geothermal, compared it to five other heating and cooling technologies in six different major cities. These cities not only reflected a different climate, but they also reflected a different mix of electricity. And looking at even the worst case scenarios, geothermal was proven to be more efficient than the best gas furnace. And frankly, the gas furnaces of today have reached their limit. They're not going to get any more efficient. Whereas geothermal heat pumps just within the last three years are incorporating variable speed compressors with COPs, or coefficient of performance, greater than five. So the heat pumps can keep getting better as compressors and heat exchangers uh, develop further. At the heart of the outdoor part of the system is high-density polyethylene pipe developed by the natural gas industry to transport natural gas and it's actually made and derived from natural gas. And my goal is to use their pipe to put them out of business. So it's incredible materi material, incredibly robust. You'll see the what we call the U-bend fitting connected to the pipe, and you see a, a couple double rollback beads. That's where it's all heat fused together, and that joint, due to the cross-linking of the polyethylene molecules, becomes stronger than the pipe itself. So when you build a geothermal loop field, every joint is heat fused. You can think of that entire loop field as one continuous piece of plastic that has a guarantee from just about every manufacturer of 50 years, has a design life of 100 years, and environmentalists say it'll last forever. Because indeed it is a plastic. The magic, however, of a geothermal system is the heat pump. 
How many of you could tell me what a heat pump is? Maybe. We're keeping it a secret. So maybe in one of your other courses you can dig a little deeper. But let me introduce it to you. News, uh, newspaper headline, New York Times. GE ready to push heat pump sales. And that was before I was even a gleam in my mother's eye. So heat pumps have been around. Certainly in theory from Carnot in the 1800s to today's pretty sophisticated equipment. Uh, they, they are pretty, uh, pretty amazing devices. And where is your heat pump? You guys may drink uh, um, Sam Adams, but I'm sure you drink something that needs to come from the store to your home. And by the time you get it home, it probably needs to be chilled a little bit. So let's cool it down. Let's take it from 50 to 40 degrees. We're going to extract heat, BTUs. And lo and behold, your feet might get warmed up in the process. And of course, you all recognize this as the classic beer to feet heat pump or refrigerator. Same principle. We can extract heat from something that's cold and with the use of a compressor, move that heat into a warmer environment. It's like rolling a ball uphill. Yeah, it takes a little energy. We're going to roll heat uphill. And it takes a little energy. We're not making the heat. We're merely moving it. And where does that heat come from? Well, it come, came from the earth. And as the heat pump draws heat out of that fluid that's running through our pipe, we're chilling it down. It gets colder. Our beer got colder. The fluid's going to get colder. And when that cold fluid goes out into the ground, it creates a thermal depression surrounded by tons and tons and tons of earth at 50 degrees. So if we can create a cold spot out in the ground at 35 degrees, heat will naturally flow. There's nothing to regulate, no valves, nothing. It will happen. I was asked once by a maintenance man at uh, Millbrook High School, and I was making a presentation to the dean and a bunch of other people, and the maintenance guy was stuck. He said, oh, come on, boilers, man, they're reliable. Yeah, I have to work on them once in a while, but, you know, nothing goes wrong with them. Pipe buried in the ground, literally no maintenance. So, and he was also convinced that since boilers that he's working on are up around 92, 94%, that a geothermal system could not be more efficient than that. So we had a fun discussion. So we've got these cold spots out in the ground, surrounded by 50 degree earth. Our fluid may go out to the ground at 38 degrees, and as it travels through that pipe, it warms up. It might come back at 44 degrees. And it is constantly changing. And it's one of the misconceptions about geothermal, that because we're plugged into the earth at 50 degrees, that water should always be 50 degrees. No. You need a temperature difference to transfer heat. And on the coldest day of the year, we may need 20 degrees to transfer enough heat. On a mild day, maybe we only need 5 de degrees. So it is a constantly changing temperature that's coming in from the earth. And a lot of maintenance guys call me up and say, boy, it's, uh, it's 42 today. And a few weeks later, he calls me up, it's 34 today, something's not working. Yeah, it is working fine. So we're going to always struggle with that uh, need to educate. So now we're going to connect this fluid to our heat pump. And we're going to bring in that 44 degree water where the heat pump is going to take 6 degrees of heat out of it, send it back to the earth at 38. It's also going to heat up air. We have return air at about 68 degrees. It'll come out of our 
Magic heat pump at about 95. So we're going to warm up the airstream. And for those anal members of our audience who like to do the math, the formulas are real simple. 1.08 to make all the units work out properly. How many cubic feet a minute? And what is the temperature rise? So on the air side, 1.08 times 2,000 CFM, which corresponds to what we call a 5-ton heat pump. Could probably heat a 3,500 square foot house. Could air condition about 2,000 square feet of commercial space. So it's pretty average size, 5 ton. And this heat pump will put out 58,000 BTUs an hour at these conditions. Now on the water side, yeah, question? Yeah, when geothermal systems are sized in tonnage, is that the ton, that's the tons of the, uh, the actual liquid in the loop, correct or no? What is the ton? No, it's a ton that is... Um, has a wonderful derivation. It's the amount of cooling effect that you can get with one ton of ice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Originally, air conditionings were ice. And it, it's really a rate. It's 12,000 BTUs an hour is a ton. But that's the, the derivation is kind of interesting, and, uh, um, and it still sticks today that we, we do everything by tons. On the fluid side of this uh, particular heat pump, it's a different formula because we're different, dealing with different units, but 500 is the magic constant that makes everything work out. How many gallons a minute and what kind of temperature change does the water go through? And indeed, you do the math and we're extracting 45,000 BTUs an hour from the ground. And until the utility company can figure out a way to meter it, it's free. And if we take these two numbers and we do a little more math to calculate what we call the coefficient of performance or the COP, which is basically how many units of heat do we get out divided by how many units of heat we have to buy from the electric company. So in this case, we're getting 58,000 BTUs out of our heat pump. We're getting 45,000 of that for free. So the difference, 13,320 is what we have to buy from the utility company. And if you divide this number by 3,412, you'll get it in kilowatts. Which roughly is about, what, three, four, three and a half, four kilowatts. If it runs for one hour, we'll call it four kilowatt hours. So that's the basics. Um, ratio turns out to be 4.38, meaning for every unit of heat we buy, we, we are delivering to the house or the building 4.38. And that, too, is a number that's constantly changing. Don't you think the industry might see... Uh faster growth if they started to just refer to this as 438% efficient? Certainly that is done periodically, but then it gets countered by, well, you're not counting the efficiency of the power plant to produce that electricity, and you start burrowing down rabbit holes that frankly become a distraction, but we're all taught growing up that 100% efficiency, you know, you can't do better than that. So the efficiency, yeah, it sounds great, but I'd rather take the tack that we educate. So what does a heat pump look like? It's really quite simple. You have a compressor with a motor attached to it, W, that's the amount of work that we put into the motor to do the compression. We compress a gas. And if you've ever pumped up your bicycle tires with a hand pump and you're sitting there pumping away, if you're holding on down at the bottom, you may have to let go because it gets pretty darn hot. Same thing happens with a refrigerant going through a compressor. 
We take it from a low pressure to a high pressure. We not only increase the pressure, but we increase the temperature. And that hot gas then goes into a heat exchanger that we call the condenser, where that hot gas turns back into a liquid, gives up a tremendous amount of heat that is being absorbed, in this case, by water going through that condenser coil, and we could be heating water. Or we could have a coil like a radiator on your car that you blow air over it and you increase the temperature of the air, but you're extracting heat from the refrigerant, causing it to condense into a liquid. That high-pressure liquid then travels up the, the liquid line and enters a device. It could be a capillary tube. It's called a throttling valve. It's called a thermostatic expansion valve. Think of it as nothing more than a very small hole. And this compressor is pushing that liquid through that hole. And it's doing what we call flashing. Some of it turns into a vapor. The bulk of it becomes a liquid at a much colder temperature. And more importantly, it's at a very low pressure which makes it want to boil at a much lower temperature. So now we've got this liquid that is ready to boil. All we got to do is add it some heat. So we run it through another heat exchanger, and this one might be connected to our loop field where our 44 degree water is essentially surrounding this refrigerant that is probably wanting to boil at about 30 degrees. I got warmth around me, I'm going to boil. So the refrigerant boils off, becomes a vapor again at a low pressure. And then it goes into the compressor and it repeats the process. Phase change is the key that we're changing from a liquid to a gas or a gas to a liquid. And that heat of fusion, the latent heat, embodies a tremendous amount of BTUs at a fairly constant temperature. So there's a lot of refrigerants out there. Water is actually a refrigerant. Uh, carbon dioxide is being experimented with as a refrigerant. Certainly the old R11, R12, R22s are being taken out of commission due to the impact to the ozone layer. So we're always looking for a better refrigerant. Today we use R410A. Um, which is serving our purpose, but we're all hoping there's something better to be developed. Now you can take this basic cycle and you can throw a reversing valve in the piping. So the compressor is always running in the same direction, but that hot, high pressure gas can either go to one coil or it can go to the other coil. So the same hardware can do both heating or cooling. Reversible. Here's some boxes. There are a lot of flavors of e-pumps. They come in many, many different configurations from a half a ton up to 30 ton. A very flexible hardware that can be packaged in a variety of ways. The one on the right made by Geostar is a variable speed compressor. And I've illustrated on the left there a graph of a particular job up near Buffalo that has a variable speed product in it. And it was last night. That heat pump turned on once to provide just enough heat. And if it was starting to get a hair over the set point, it would slow down. And that's what the kilowatt graph illustrates, is that as the night wore on, it didn't need quite as much heat, so it's throttling down and eventually turned off. Compared to the heat pump that I have in my house, which cycles on, cycles off. And I didn't, I didn't have a good graph of that one last night, but it must have cycled on and off uh, three or four dozen times. And any piece of hardware that can run steady state is going to be more efficient than one that's full on or full off. Basic technology improvement. 
available today. Here's a illustration of a loop field design we did for Bard College's new science building. And every there's a bunch of little dots on the left connected together by, uh, by what we call the spider loop. We've got eight vertical bores with inch and a quarter pipe in them that we built this header that puts them all in parallel with each other. And we did that multiple times, bringing each of those groups of eight into a valve manifold in the mechanical room. Fairly straightforward, and we can we got tools to help us calculate how much vertical drilling do we need to get the job done. Here's another one of my favorite projects in Auburn, New York. The gentleman on the left owns Laska's. If you've ever eaten at Laska's, it's a wonderful place to eat. So needless to say, when I was working with uh, Kevin on his uh, project for his father that he put in himself, uh, I was eating very well. So, but this is where the pipes, he's got four horizontal loops buried outside the house. And he brings them in, connects them to a manifold, and one goes into the heat pump, and the other one comes out of the heat pump and goes back to the loop field. This is the interior manifold at Bard College. So it's a technology that is scalable beyond belief. Um, let's see if we get some other examples. Well, let me illustrate. On a commercial job, we have to calculate those peak heating requirements on the coldest day of the year. And we do all our number crunching, and we size a loop field that's capable of absorbing enough heat from the ground to feed all the heat pumps. Okay, so that determines the size we need for heating. And then six months later, all these heat pumps might be in the cooling mode and are rejecting heat out into the ground. So we do our calculations and we come up, okay, now the loop field's got to be this big. Sometimes it's bigger than the heating one. Sometimes it's smaller. So we just take the bigger of the two and our design is pretty well done. But the magic of geothermal is that most of the time you will have rooms like this one that need air conditioning. And you may have a room on the north side that's not getting any sun on a day like today and maybe it needs some heating. So if we were truly operating in cooling in this room, our heat would feed into the system, go down the hall, and feed into the heat pump that's heating another room. So it is the ultimate energy recovery system, moving heat around the building. And when it gets the loop gets too hot, we'll send it out to the earth loop and get rid of the heat out there. So the efficiencies associated with moving heat, a computer room, a client, an owner of a building has to pay for all that electricity to run the computers. All that, electric, all that electricity is basically electric heat. Those computers, if they're eating up 5,000 watts of electricity, well, it all turns into heat. It doesn't take much to move the little electrons through a solid-state device. Um, and even if it does, it turns into friction and heats up. So all that energy that's coming off those computers can be harvested through this technology and used to heat another room or domestic water. So although the owner's buying the electricity once, he's using it twice. Recent examples. Down in Ithaca, the Peggy Ryan Williams Center, obtained a LEED Platinum rating. SUNY Oswego Science Building, largest geothermal project in New York State. Skidmore College, we've done multiple projects at Skidmore. Cayuga Community College, Auburn City Hall, and what really got me going is a Cambria project down in Evansburg, Pennsylvania, which was the first LEED gold-rated building under LEED uh, 2.0. This is the Ithaca College job, and my architect buddy, Quay Thompson, was out there locating where we decided to put the test bore 
And I say it's the first time I ever get an architect to work for me. So, Quay is an excellent uh, guy working at uh, Holt Architects. The process of putting the loop field in could make it look like uh, Beirut or some other bombarded landscape. These are the loops sticking out of the ground and it takes a lot of effort to do that but when you're all done you end up with a pretty nice building and nobody can see the loop field anyway. Skidmore this is our first energy node where we put in one loop field and we're distributing it out to eventually five buildings. They're going to build another one. We got the uh, Zankel Music Center, the JKB Theater. Uh, what is that one? I can't even read them. Uh, Saislin Arts Center. But the magic of doing this is when they have a performance in Zankel and all the people have filled the auditoriums, it's going to need a lot of cooling. There may be another building in this node that needs heating. So we're not only moving heat up and down the hallway, we're moving it around campus. Um, tremendous economies of scale and what we call load diversity. If we were to put an individual loop field for every building, it would probably be 30 to 40 percent bigger than the one consolidated loop field to handle all five buildings. So that is becoming a common practice. We're on our third node design at Skidmore. This is what the inside of the mechanical room looks like in the energy node. It's a bunch of headers and pumps, a big expansion tank. Uh, pretty simple. All constructed out of high density polyethylene. Lemoyne College, the one I talked about earlier and getting some uh, notoriety for. But I love this picture. That girl was just infatuated and curious. And uh, hopefully we're going to try to make the planet a little better. With, with your help, we might get there. So she has something to look forward to. Drilling a test hole at Keyview Community College. Middle of winter. If it was like this last winter, that may not have happened. But a typical winter, they can drill through frozen ground. You can't dig trenches very well but at least you can do some prep work and uh, drill some test holes. Another one of my favorite jobs, Memorial City Hall in Auburn, New York. It was a 70 year old building that never had air conditioning. And I was up on the third floor of a, uh, a hot summer afternoon and it was literally over a hundred degrees where these city workers were working. Windows open, they heard all the noise from the traffic, papers are blowing all over their desk when the wind picks up. It was pretty miserable, but it's such a historical treasure in the city of Auburn that conventional air conditioning was not acceptable. An outdoor condensing unit making noise somewhere was just not something they wanted to tolerate. So we proposed geothermal. They asked us to compare it to a conventional system. Both of them cost about a million dollars. So geothermal did not cost any more than a conventional approach, if done right. What I really learned on this job, and I hope you guys remember it, there was many of us who were paid a lot of money to sit in the ivory tower to design this. I was an engineer, we had an architect, we had the whole team. We developed a phasing plan where we would empty the building floor by floor, move them out into trailers, move the internet, move the phones out there so that we could work on the third floor. And then we work our way down the second floor. We move all those people back in, move the second floor out. We spent hundreds of man hours. It probably averaged over triple digits, you know, $120 an hour, something like that for everybody involved. Hundreds of hours. We sent the documents out to bid. Tony Siracusa. 
Syracuse Mechanical, local mechanical contractor in Auburn. He didn't announce it until he got awarded the job, but then he called me up and he said, listen, what if I leave the heat on and we don't move the people out? We'll work around them. So that's what you see here on the left. They simply moved the existing radiators out about 12 inches, left the heat on. They did their new piping along the wall and eventually water source heat pumps would go right there. But as you can see on the right, the people's desks were still functional, they were operational, saved the city of Auburn tens of thousands of dollars of avoided cost created by a bunch of engineers and architects who really uh, didn't think out of the box. So indeed appreciate the perspective that contractors bring to the party. They're pretty practical people and they're pretty creative. McQuay, I used to sing this tune, McQuay fired up, they actually built the heat pumps in Auburn, New York. It went into Auburn City Hall. Since then, McQuay announced that they're closing the factory. More jobs that are being lost. Thankfully, just about 99% of all geothermal heat pumps are still made in the USA. Now, I usually threaten my audience by saying each one of these bullet points I'm going to talk 20 minutes about. And that usually scares people. I say, oh my God, how long am I going to be here? Maybe we'll just say it's uh, your homework. There are so many different benefits to geothermal that it's hard to sum them all up. As I mentioned, Auburn City Hall is a historic landmark. Geothermal was favorable. I worked on uh, Madison's home down in Orange, Virginia. Historical project, archaeologically intense. Took us forever to do the project because there was a bunch of uh, grad students out there sifting through dirt. But uh, uh, very appealing for the historical renovation, preservation work that goes on. Um, aesthetics, noise, minimal maintenance, environmentally friendly, safety. How many homes and places have we seen blow up due to natural gas or propane? Quite a few. But it really doesn't make the news very often. <clears throat> Carbon monoxide poisoning, another one, safety aspect. Reliable, high-tech, people like bragging about their geothermal system. So there's many reasons to consider geothermal beyond just one-dimensional payback. I get frustrated when everybody tries to justify <coughs> some of the most important work in a building based on payback only. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Let's talk a little bit about maintenance. This was a study conducted by Kineta Research, funded by ASHRAE, very well vetted. Um, illustrates that geothermal, whether you've got in-house personnel or contractor uh, personnel, this is in cents per square foot per year, I believe the units, but geothermal is significantly lower than other conventional technologies. Now I'm going to start bringing these uh, together, the early introduction, and what does geothermal, how does it connect to climate change? And indeed, this is a graph directly out of the EPA report, illustrating the carbon emissions for these six different technologies in the six different cities. There's one in particular that jumps out at me. And this is where somebody's going to enthusiastically shout it out. Chicago. Well, Chicago is definitely noticeable. How about the opposite extreme? Portland. Portland. How come the carbon emissions on the black bar, the geothermal, is so low? I don't know. Hydro. 
It's rare, I usually, I don't get that until about the second or third answer. Everybody says it's the climate. No, it's hydro. Renewably generated electricity with very little carbon emission content. Let's go back to Chicago. Why is it so high? Coal. Coal. 95% of the electricity that serves Chicago is generated in coal-fired power plants. So, looking at Chicago, even with coal-fired power plants, geothermal is equal to the best other technology, which was an uh, a engine-driven heat pump developed by York, and after about four years of trying to market it, they pulled it off the market. So it's not even available today. But it's better than everything else that's available today. So, what did we learn? Well, if we can generate our electricity renewably, some magic begins to happen. Let's go back to the graph that I showed you earlier. Our office building. If we feed that building with renewably generated electricity and run a geothermal system, two things are going to happen. One which is almost miraculous. Zero carbon <coughs> is achievable, available today. Whether you develop those electrons on site with your own solar <coughs> PV wind array, or you buy them off the grid. Doesn't matter. Zero carbon footprint for that building is achievable. Yeah, that was going to be my question. Do you also do solar uh, with your geothermal? Well, I, I'm not involved in the transaction, but many of our contractors that we sell heat pumps to uh, do solar PV. So you would be interested in expanding and taking PV under your wing? Not marketing them together? That, that. The landscape has already got a bunch of pretty high-powered solar PV providers. And it's very cutthroat because I could stock up my inventory one day and the next day, next day it's worth less. The decline in PV panels, last I heard it's like tw somewhere between 25 cents and 40 cents a watt. And it wasn't that long ago when it was $10 a watt. So it's a tough market to be in and only if you're a big player can you really do well financially. So, but I put geothermal in my own house. I bought it about 10 years ago. The first thing I did was bring a drill rig into the front yard. My neighbors got all nervous, started calling the town. We didn't even meet them yet. I'm out making a racket in the community. And indeed, one of the neighbors called them and said, are you going to do that to my house too? So, no. Um, but uh, put loops in the front yard. Now we got grass there. Nobody knows the difference. Uh, I also put 7.6 kW of PV on the roof, and I won't be fully net zero, but I'll be about 80% offset. And finally, I've got five days in a row with negative electricity. I love it. Winter was tough. <laughs> but I'm a big fan of PV, no doubt about it. But in this scenario, there's going to be a second thing that happens. That is, grandma is going to become public enemy number one. So we're out to get grandma too. Let's get oil out of the home heating arena. So Let's do a little thought experiment. You guys ever do thought experiments? Einstein did. If you're not familiar with the thought experiments he conducted in his head, it, it's worth a good read about being on a train that's traveling at the speed of light and what happens when lightning strikes the front and you're in the caboose and a whole bunch of things. He would talk about two trains heading at each other at the speed of light. What is their speed of closure? Well, you'd think twice the speed of light, but it's not speed of light. So, anyway, our little thought experiment, 
What would need to happen to our electrical grid if suddenly every facility was net zero using PV or wind? What would need to happen? I'm not giving up on you. You can come up with something. Let me give you a little clue. The last few days, I've been very sunny. I'm pumping electrons back into the grid. Storage. Storage is not a trivial undertaking. Germany, who pushed PV aggressively, is now facing grid management challenges that are unbelievable. And they're only 20% of their electricity is provided by PV. It's the fact that a sunny afternoon, they got more electricity than they know what to do with. And at 5, 6 o'clock at night, people are coming home, firing up everything. The sun's getting a little lower. And bingo, they got to fire up a whole bunch of power plants. Think about managing our current grid system. If suddenly every house was either buying or making enough electricity to serve 100% of their needs, estimates are hundreds of billions of dollars have to be invested in the infrastructure. Battery storage, pump storage, huge projects just to make solar and PV be a part of the landscape. I would almost say that's unsustainable. As much as we'd like to call solar sustainable, from a financial perspective, as it scales up, it is unsustainable. We're already witnessing it in other countries. And when you force an electric utility company who makes money by selling kilowatt hours into a mode where they're losing revenue, they're being forced to accept the PV produced electrons, <coughs> so they're making less revenue, it's not reducing their peak, and it's forcing them to come up with elaborate management protocols facilities that can be ramped up and down at a moment's notice, and you can't do that with a nuclear power plant. Uh, combined cycled gas turbine plants are pretty flexible, pretty efficient. Uh, they're actually putting them in that downtown New York City to give themselves a little more flexibility. But hundreds of billions of dollars in New York State alone to develop storage. So what we have been calling sustainable is really not. Thought experiment number two. What would need to happen to our electrical grid if suddenly every facility was heated and cooled with geothermal? Any guess? Nothing. Geothermal would actually reduce the peak load in the summertime because it's a much more efficient air conditioning system. And it fills the coffers of the electric company with more revenue. We divert revenue away from fossil fuel companies. We put it in the hands of our electric utility company who is now managing a grid that is pretty easy to manage. So if we want to push PV, we need to build a foundation. <coughs> and I've tried to develop these slides. If we simply look at the basic need, the basic need for heat, you got a house leaking heat on a cold day. Now, first and foremost, I'm an advocate of reducing the amount of heat. Building Performance Institute is standing, you know, got a bunch of protocols, blower door test, insulating, weather, weatherizing homes. Let's reduce the amount of heat we need. But when we get done doing that, we still need heat. So the current vicious cycle is, it's not only heat that's coming out of that home, it's money. 
That money is going to go into the pockets of major suppliers of fossil fuels. We then turn around, since most of them are merely uh, brokers, they're going to send a good chunk of that money offshore to other countries. Certainly U.S. production has gone up recently, but I would say the environmental impact can also be questioned. Uh, and out of all that money that goes overseas, guess what? Some of it's going to go into some people's hands that we don't really like to see funded. doesn't take much to be bled off the cycle. After all, how much money did it take to kill 3,000 people? Not a lot. So, we are caught in a cycle that is frightening. Let's look at it a little differently. Let's put geothermal in this house. And guess what? 60, per, 60 to 80 percent of the heat is going to come from the ground. That sounds good. Okay, the other 20 to 40 percent, we got to buy electricity. So we're going to send money to the electric providers. The revenues go up. They become financially healthy. Niagara Mohawk, RG&E, NYSEG were all on the verge of bankruptcy not many years ago. Had to have a white knight come in and buy them out. Now it's National Grid and I forget who the other ones are. But the electric utility companies are facing an awesome challenge in the coming decades. So if we can make them financially a little more flush, they can turn around and develop the smart grid. And then we can make these renewable technologies, we can keep them sustainable. But without the foundation, without a healthy electric infrastructure, without stealing revenue from the oil companies, I don't know who's going to make the smart grid investment. It's going to come back on the ratepayers, and the cost per kilowatt hour is going to become outrageous. So with that, I conclude my remarks. Let's see how close I was. Eh, not bad. Questions? Come on, Kevin told, you, told me you were smart. So let's ask some questions. How deep do you have to put the geothermal system underground? Yeah, how deep? Well, 75% of the residential homes that we're involved with, six feet deep. They're horizontal loops, buried down deep enough that we get a warm enough surrounding. Yeah, it gets colder than uh, deeper. Might go down to 40, 42 degrees at six feet. But we're below the frost line and we can maintain a reasonably good temperature of water coming in. When we go vertical, it's a bit based on the actual location, the drilling conditions. In New York State, we can't go deeper than 500 feet unless we want to buy a permit from the uh, Department of Natural Resources, a mining permit. So we generally don't go deeper than 500 feet. But anywhere in between, it's uh, perfectly fine. When you drill down and test, what are you testing for? Well... 80% of the knowledge is simply characterizing the local geology. What kind of rock is it? How deep is it to bedrock? What kind of water formations do we run into? Uh, in Auburn, it's nasty. It's limestone that has voids. So you'd be drilling a log and all of a sudden the drill rod just drops. And knowing what kind of void uh, challenges they're going to have, uh, it's important to find out, and that's why we drill a test hole. Uh, then we run a 48-hour thermal conductivity test where we pump heated water through the pipe in the ground, and we measure how long and how far it warms up in 48 hours. If it doesn't warm up very much, we've measured the amount of heat going into the ground, and if it doesn't warm up very much, that, that means we're dissipating and underground very easily. If it gets real hot, 
then we don't have good conductivity. So that's what we're testing for. Can you use the same rigs as like a well drilling rig? Yeah, pretty much. In the Northeast, we're blessed with a pretty hard bedrock. Uh, so whether you're drilling a water well or a geothermal well, you need a pretty stiff rig. Uh, anywhere from 600000 to a million dollar rig. Okay, what else? So for like, because geothermal is typically used for, you know, um, kind of buildings that are by themselves and everything. And I mean, thinking future-wise, and because cities, they use a lot of energy. Is there any, like, possibility of that being implemented? Or is it there's just too much and it's too complicated? The challenge really in tight urban environments is just finding a spot to drill the hole. Most homes you might be able to do with one hole, maybe two, but typically no more than that. So it's about being able to get a rig and a location defined. And I'm working on a project downtown Syracuse, and it's a driller's challenge. Um, the homeowner happens to be an engineer, and he is committed to put geothermal in. He doesn't care what it takes, but uh, talking to one of the drillers today, trying to uh, walk our way through the options. But there's no reason why it can't be done in a tight urban environment if we can get the loop in the ground. If you're doing like you said, you only have to drill down six feet for some residential homes, why does it cost that much? Well, digging a trench 125 feet long, th three foot wide, six foot deep, multiple times, uh, it costs money. You've got an excavator. Uh, you can dig uh, typically three, four, five ton a day with an excavator and then uh, two men working on site. A horizontal loop costs about $1,500 a ton, give or take. A vertical loop will cost about $3,000 a ton, uh, just because of the expense of the drilling machinery and all that. So if someone dug their own trench, would you come in and do the piping, or would you want to do everything yourself? We have contractors that do uh, engage in what we call homeowners, uh, homeowner sweat equity. Some of them don't mind that at all. Um, others don't touch it. Um, so, yeah, we can give you dr uh, contractor names, because one, we only sell heat pumps to a contractor. Uh, somebody's got to be responsible for maintaining it, doing warranty claims and all that nightmare stuff. So, but digging a trench, it's between you and the contractor. With vertical loops, how often do you guys run into like, problems or roadblocks? Like is, are there a lot of uh, unforeseen um, geologic problems? The short answer is yes. And we used to have a saying, every hole is a new adventure. You really don't know. Uh, small job in Auburn, the uh, police station, 24 holes. Drilling through limestone and shale, and the bits tend to wander. And because of the plane of the shale, all the holes were wandering in the same direction. Out of 24 holes, he drilled into two holes that were already looped and grouted. That's a royal pain, because that polyethylene pipe just gets twisted around the drill bit, and the stuff will not break. It's pretty tenacious. Um, tore it up pretty good spent hours, days, trying to back out of the hole and try again. Yeah. So, well, well, when you guys drill, you usually is about 20 feet, or how far apart? 20 feet apart is a good number, um, and generally it's because we don't want one hole communicating with another hole. It's in, because of that drift of the drill. And the drift of the drill bit. Because uh, they want they want to go fast. It's all about productivity. You know, 80 to 100 feet an hour is not unheard of. And when they're drilling that fast, they're not really caring where that bit's going. 
If they have to slow down and drill a straighter hole, that costs them money. So indeed, 20 feet seems to work well. Uh, when we go shallower, maybe 100 to 200 feet, I will tighten it up to 12 to 15 feet apart. Um, but it's in general good number to start with. Okay, I hope you all passed my test. Certainly, if, uh, if you ever want to follow up about geothermal, Kevin knows how to get a hold of me, and uh, I'd be glad to answer any more questions. So thank you much.